In this series, I'm visiting some of Britain's most outstanding areas of natural beauty to explore the fascinating wildlife that has made these places their home. This week, I've come to the south coast to explore the chalk habitats of Sussex. I'm starting my journey at the foot of these dramatic cliffs near Beachy Head. Doesn't look very inspiring, does it? And it's very soft, a lump of chalk. But this humble rock supports some of the most amazing British wildlife. These brilliant white cliffs are one end of a vast chalk seam that stretches almost 100 kilometers west along England's south coast. It supports an amazing variety of wildlife by creating specialized habitats from the chalk grasslands of the South Downs to the ancient woodland in West Sussex. While I'm here, I'm hoping to see a peregrine falcon and her chicks, the striking rare Adonis blue butterfly, and one of our favorite native mammals, the badger. Chalk is made up of the skeletal remains of minute mollusks and shells which accumulated on the sea floor. It represents millions upon millions of years of life in the sea, compressed by the weight of gravity into a near solid block. The constant battering of the waves helps these chalk cliffs at Seaford maintain their pristine white face. Well, it's a really rough old day here on the, on the shore, but you can see sheltering on the cliffs there are kittiwakes. And they're a really interesting bird. They only just come to Britain. Literally, I think that's their toehold on the United Kingdom, where they're, they're sitting on eggs there. They're going to nest on those little tiny ledges on these chalk cliffs. These birds don't go inland. They're ocean-going birds. They're a real racing car of the sky. They're fantastic to watch for that effortless glide. They just lift their wing and they move. They make it look so easy. These gentle-looking birds can be identified from other gulls by their solid black wingtips that look like they've just been dipped in ink. I don't know of any other bird that really skims across the tops of the breakers like a kittiwake will. They, they just equip for it. Real acrobats. I could watch these graceful birds all day, but what I really want to explore is on the top of these cliffs, the grassland and woodland habitats that thrive on this chalky soil. When you come inland from the coast, you find you're on top of a, a range of hills called the South Downs, and this is the north-facing slope. It's the steep slope, and so it's more wooded because it's difficult for agriculture. Just south of London, there's another range of hills, the North Downs. They're also made of chalk, and in between, you've got the wheel. Now, these two ranges of hills run not quite parallel. They actually converge further west of here towards Farnham and Winchester. But this chalkland is so rich in plant life. The rolling green hills of the South Downs look like the quintessential English scene. But this is a managed habitat, and man's intervention has had a major impact on the landscape. Centuries of traditional farming and grazing have kept the grass turf short and kept scrub at bay, creating the perfect home for wild grasses and flowers to thrive. Summer sees the grassland in its full glory with up to 56 species per square meter. It's actually because the thin topsoil overlying the chalk bedrock is dry and nutrient poor that they do so well. It isn't fertile enough for more vigorous species to grow and dominate. So the grasslands are filled with a wonderful diversity of low growing flowers. The grassland here is so rich in species. It's just teeming with different things. The plants here also, because of the grazing, they're almost bonsai versions. And you can really see that with this little orchid here. Have a look at this. This is the fragrant orchid. And it gets its name from its wonderful fragrance. It's a really well-named plant and so delicate and beautiful. 
really disappoints me that people think that they can dig these up and take them home to their gardens. They don't normally take because the plant is so specifically adapted to this location. It is a plant that should be savoured in the wild and just left there. This specialised habitat once covered extensive areas of the South Downs, but due to an increase in intensive farming and recreation, this habitat has become scarce and fragmented. But in places like Malling Down, the Sussex Wildlife Trust have reintroduced traditional grazing to preserve this precious habitat that is vital for the wild flowers and the wealth of rare insects and invertebrates that rely on these specialised plants. This was a great place to, to grow up. I spent all of my childhood on chalk downs. And one of the things I used to look for back then was the Adonis blue butterfly. And it was really mysterious because you could never find it. But today it's a different story. There are places where it's doing really well. This is largely thanks to the work of the Sussex Wildlife Trust. Ecologist Graham Lyons is responsible for surveying the plants and wildlife at their 34 nature reserves. I think it's fantastic that these areas are now, you know, returning to a condition where the butterflies benefit. Yeah, many of these sites in the Adonis Blues have already come back to the populations as it was like 100 years ago. But the Adonis Blue is, uh, I like, it's a golf ball. That would be a fox who's brought that there. I'd lay odds on it. You know, they, they think they're eggs and they bury them. <laughs> but um, the Adonis Blue doesn't move around very much, so it's slow to populate new areas. Absolutely. The average male won't move more than 50 to 100 metres away from the colony in its lifetime. The caterpillar of the Adonis blue is the fussiest of eaters, feeding only on one plant, the bright yellow horseshoe vetch, that only grows in short grass on chalk downland. Here. Aha. Here we go. It's a very old one. It's a male Adonis. It's a male Adonis. The main way to tell them on, from the underside is the edge of the wing has black veins that run into the wing, which give the, the edge of the wing a checkered appearance. I mean, the blue is quite intense, though, even on the underside, isn't it? I mean, that, for me, is really quite something to see, because I can't tell you how long I spent trying to see these things when I was younger, and it was really frustrating. And now, you know, if you go to the right place, they're easy to see. Part of the magic of studying nature is to take the time to look closely at things, to see the detail. How lovely. Whoa. Oh, did you see the blue? The intensity of that blue. You know, in the past, in the old days, the unenlightened days, if you like, people would collect them, and they'd collect lots and lots of these particular butterflies because of the different shades and varieties of blue that you got. I think it's much better that you can just watch them and look at them. Of course, with every habitat, there's a whole ecological system that relies on the health of each part of the food chain. The insects and invertebrates that live and breed amongst the plants here are a vital food source for the bird life of the South Downs, which in turn become prey for one of Britain's most impressive predators. Isn't that fantastic? That is what's at the top of the food chain here on the Downs. It's a peregrine falcon. I love watching them when they half fold their wings. It's awesome. Lovely. Next, I'll be finding out why this falcon is making such a racket and just like our ancestors, I'll be using treasures from one of Britain's most ancient forests to create fire. I'm in Sussex, exploring the wild habitats created by chalk, from the stunning white cliffs of the south coast to the precious grasslands of the South Downs. Although chalk itself is dry and relatively infertile, it supports a host of specialist wildlife from delicate wild plants to skilled predators at the top of the food chain like this peregrine falcon. The peregrine is nesting 
on an abandoned chalk quarry, the inland equivalent of a sea cliff. One of the things about peregrines, of course, is they pick inaccessible spots for their nests. It's a way of protecting themselves against predation. But it makes the job for conservation experts also really difficult. You can hear this bird is really unhappy because we've got climbers now visiting the nest. They're going to collect the chicks, bring them to the bottom of the cliff so that we can ring them, examine them and then send them back. It's vitally important that data is collected so that we understand what's happening to the peregrine population. Dave Pegler is a specialist chalk climber working alongside the Sussex Peregrine Study that has a license to monitor the birds as part of an ongoing project. And they've got sharp claws already, that's for sure. Pegler and the team work quickly to minimise any distress caused to the birds. With me on the ground are the study's co-directors and raptor experts, John Franklin and Phil Everett. There they are. Oh, they're quite big, aren't they? Yeah, How old are they now? 29, 30 days. Right, here we go. They are quite feisty. Oh, yeah, look at that. He's having a go. Yeah. Oh, they've got some talons as well, haven't they? Putting them in the bag does mean that you have this sort of slight problem getting them out of the bag, but it's much safer than doing it up at the nest site. It would be unsafe for both you and, and the, the bird, yeah. definitely. The female up there was ringing in Chichester Cathedral in 2002. Now we're ringing her chicks. To anyone who's not seen this done, they might think this is quite distressing, but actually it's not really, is it? It's a pretty safe procedure, provided you do it properly. Now what happens? We take the wing length, the tail length, and we also weigh the birds and look at the size of their feet to determine whether they're male or female. How important is the data that you collect in this way? We've been studying the repopulation of peregrines in Sussex. Peregrines died out in Sussex in 1957 because of pesticides. Healthy population, and suddenly, within three years, they disappeared. John found the first new nest in 1990, and since then, the population's built up and that's what we've been studying, is the expansion. Shall I bring one out? Let's go Have a go. It. Hello. Now, this bird really doesn't want me to pick it up. Have you got one? Well done, Ray. There. There. Ah. How's that? See? I'm not going to hurt you. I'm just going to bring you over here. It's all right. Yeah. All so, right. The peregrines in... Um, in Sussex have been a tremendous success story, haven't they? They have. We've got 30 pairs breeding in Sussex now, but we've reached a peak now where there aren't natural sites for them to nest on anymore, and they're now starting to nest on urban sites. So we've got one nesting on the top of a hospital, for instance. Such beautiful birds, though, aren't they? Oh, gorgeous. And to think that they're the fastest creature on fastest the planet. Fastest creature on the planet. They've now been recorded at flying at over 200 miles an hour. Absolutely amazing speed. Well, it's a success story. Let's uh, get these birds back to where they belong. Now, Phil, people may be wondering, you know, now that the birds have been handled, is there any risk of the adults rejecting them? No, no, no. All that they've done for the year is about raising those chicks. And as you can hear, the female has been calling, calling, calling. That's why we try and do it as quickly as we possibly can, get them back, and she'll be back tending to them, just checking them out, seeing they're OK. That is a really fantastic sight. You can hear those chicks there, they're incredibly vocal, now they're being returned to the nest. And it feels very special to have touched their lives, even if it's only for just but the briefest moment. And those rings on their legs and the data that's collected is so important in monitoring the species. Their whole future is bound up in these kind of operations. As I continue my journey westwards along the chalk seam, I arrive at another rare habitat of international importance. The ancient yew grove of Kingly Vale is one of only a few yew woodlands in Europe. These majestic gnarled trees are amongst the oldest living things in Britain, some over 2,000 years old. They thrive on the dry, porous soil created by the underlying chalk. When you enter the heart of the forest, you get a real sense of the ancient wildwood that once covered Britain. The yew tree is a really fascinating tree. It's called both the tree of life and the tree of death. It's certainly deadly. It's one of the most poisonous plants to be found in Britain. 
Strangely enough, the chemicals that are toxic are now being used to treat soft tissue cancers and in some ways is a life-giving tree. One of the things about yew trees, though, is that they shade out all competition. Nothing really grows underneath a yew tree. But there are a few things that grow on them, like this. There's beautiful yellow fungus here. That's the sulfur polypore, or chicken of the woods, glowing like a lantern in the shade of the yew tree. It's really very beautiful. It's been the study of my life to try to understand the values and uses of trees and plants that you find, particularly in this environment. Once you get up on these steep slopes, it's really just like rainforest. It's a real tangle. We've got a fallen ash tree here, and all over it, we've got this vine. This is clematis. And this runs right up into the forest like big creepers. In fact, as kids, we used to swing on them like Tarzan swings. The piece of the dead vine I would use as the baseboard for fire starting, like this. That's a piece of clematis I've been using for some years. And you drill into it like so. When you do this, you end up with a little ember, and you need to put that into some dry fibrous material to make fire. And the clematis sheds this long, stringy bark that can actually be woven into really strong ropes. So that makes very good tinder. And in the winter, the seed head is like cotton wool and that'll catch a spark. So it's a really useful friend. And all over this dead tree, I struggle through here, is this fungus. This is aptly named, it looks like a burnt cake, doesn't it? King Alfred's cake or cramp bores, because in the old days, people used to carry them in their pockets. Now this will also burn like charcoal, just from a spark. But I can also use it to help me with this friction fire lighting, a bit of a cheat, really. Wonderful things. Any fire in the forest carries a risk, especially after a dry spell. They're best avoided, unless, like me, you've been given special permission to light one. So, first thing I need to do is to take this bark and make it a little bit finer. It separates the fibres. A lot of dust comes out. That's good. I kept one of those cramp balls because I can use the board to ignite this and that makes the whole process a lot more easy. A little bit of smoke. That looks promising. Now, if I carefully move away the board, I should have an ember like that. And I add a bit more of the fungus. You can see how well that burns. Once that's going, I can add that to the tinder bundle. Here we go. And there's fire. And now all I have to do is add these lovely dry sticks. No messing around. Straight to the task. And that's how I think our ancestors who lived on the chalklands made fire. It's important to never leave a fire unattended so before I leave, I rake over the embers to let it die down and then put it out with water. As my day draws to a close and dusk starts to draw in, the wildlife on the edge of the forest begins to emerge. This is the ideal time for me to go in search of one creature who's made its home here in the chalk, the badger. Badgers are nocturnal and elusive, but they're still one of Britain's favorite mammals. They spend their day in their huge underground sets that they dig from the flinty chalk ground using their powerful front claws. And sure enough, my patience is rewarded. I soon get a glimpse of that unmistakable humbug-like head.
Luckily, he's too preoccupied rooting for earthworms to be bothered by me. Badgers have got this lovely white stripe on their face, but that very often takes on the colour of the local soil. Of course, the great advantage here is this chalk, so the white is really white, it's lovely. The badge has gone right down now, the far side of the set. Do you know, I've spent so long outdoors camping, I bump into these animals on a regular basis. But it's not very often you get to see them as clearly as that. They really are magic creatures. It's experiences like this that keep bringing me back outdoors. Isn't it magic? Well, for exclusive extras and the chance to win a family wildlife walkabout course at Raymere's Bushcraft School Wood Law, plus a thousand pounds in cash, go to itvwild.com. Terms and conditions apply. Well, later, hope you've brushed up on the lyrics. There's an audience with Barry Manilow at nine after Coronation Street. <laughs>